this example, we're going to determine the exact coordinates of the turning points for the function f of x, which is x times the cube root of the quadratic x squared minus 10x plus 25. And then be sure to classify each turning point as a local max or minimum. So we need our first derivative so we can figure out our critical values from that first derivative. And that will allow us to set up our intervals and identify our intervals of increase or decrease. And then we can decide whether we have any turning points or not. And then once we have that, we have to examine our turning points a little bit to see if we can figure out if we have a local max or a local min. So we've got a little bit of work to do, to say the least. And we've also left the comfort zone of the polynomial functions that we've been looking at recently. We're into a cube root of a quadratic. So that's going to be a little bit more adventurous. Uh, to make our first derivative a little easier, let's do a couple of things to clean this up, I guess, or rewrite it. I think most importantly, let's get rid of the cube root and write that as a power of a third. So this will be x squared minus 10x plus 25 to the power of 1 third. And we have a product of two functions, so there's no way we can avoid the product rule. But I think it'd be a lot easier, at least for me, if we recognize that is a perfect square, kind of by fluke. I guess it wasn't a fluke because I actually intentionally set it up that way. But anyway, it didn't necessarily have to be this way. It just is actually a little bit easier if it is. So for once, I'm looking out for you. Uh, this is x minus 5 times x minus 5. So then that's going to be raised to the power of a third. Of course, I wrote that as x minus 5 squared. So if we got that squared raised to another power, we can multiply our powers. And then we're going to have x multiplied by x minus 5 to the power of 2 thirds. So if you just went ahead and did your product rule, I'm sure you would sort it out. It'd be a little bit more of a, I guess, a, a, a windy mess, I think would be a good description of it. Um, this is a little more compact in our chain rule when we uh, start to set up our product rule here. When it's required, it's, you'll see it's actually not really required anymore because our trap function is just a basic linear function. So when we differentiate this function, finally, and step one will be to determine our critical values. It'll be the first function multiplied by the derivative of the second. And then I'll subtract one from two thirds and get a negative a third. And honestly, it's a good idea to consider your chain rule there and multiply by the derivative of the inside function. And you're like, okay, I guess I don't need to worry about the chain rule here because the derivative of the inside function is just one, but it's always a good idea to consider it. And then we move on to the second half of our product rule, which will be our second function, multiplied by the derivative of the first, and we get another multiplication by one because of derivative of x, of course, just one. I think I'll leave that multiplied uh, by one there just to make sure you can see that I did finish the product rule. And now to uh, figure out critical values, that's not really a very user-friendly uh, form of our first derivative. So of course, we'd be very wise to factor this. So first and foremost, let's pull out an x minus 5 factor. It might actually take a fraction out as well, but let's worry about this one first. This is the, this is the deal breaker here. If you don't do this, there's not much you can do to finish this question. So if I take the x minus 5, the power negative a third out, of course, I chose the smaller of the two uh, exponents that are on that x minus 5 factor. And then I have a 2 thirds multiplied by x left, the first half of that sum. And the second half of that sum, remember, predictably, you just have to rewrite that factor and plop a 1 for its exponent. And it always works with the product rule and quotient rule common factoring. Uh, but just consider if you multiply those two factors of x minus 5 together, you would add negative a third to positive 1, and it is positive 2 thirds. So it does work, and I think we're going to pull that fraction out, not the whole thing. Um, but I want to get that third out. So there's no thirds over here attached to our x minus 5, so I think I'll fabricate a third by saying the 1 in front is 3 thirds, and then I can pull out that fraction of a third as well. So I haven't considered my critical values yet, but we're getting close. So this is going to be a third comes out along with our x minus 5. 
to the power of negative a third factor. And in these brackets now, we just have 2x multiplied by that top 3 multiplied by, sorry, plus that top 3 multiplied by x minus 5. So let's uh, rewrite our derivative. We can move some stuff to the bottom. We can take that 3 down to the bottom. We can also recognize that we're going to have a cube root of x minus 5. We'll go back to our roots. And then on the top, we're going to have 3 times x, 3 times minus 5. So that's 3x minus 15. And don't forget the 2x. So that'll be 5x minus 15. And we can get rid of all that. So there's our first derivative. Like I said, we left the comfort zone of our uh, polynomial functions. Usually we would have been done with the question probably by now if it was a polynomial. Uh, but at least we're ready for our critical values. So let's move this on up and look at that derivative and say, okay, critical values. How can we make this derivative equal to zero? And that's examining the numerator, the top part. So if you want to solve 5x minus 15 equals 0, you can probably just look at that and figure out that it's 3. But if not, add 15 to both sides and divide by 5. And you get your first critical value. And I guess I can say that's x equals 3. And note that made our first derivative 0. So right now we know we have a stationary point at x equals 3 because that's a horizontal tangent. And now for the weirder one, we have to consider what's happening in the bottom. And we can have an undefined uh, first derivative here. So remember, that's also a critical value. It's kind of a worst case scenario critical value, but it's still a critical value. So if we look at x minus 5, uh, we don't have to worry about negatives uh, because cube roots can handle negatives. But of course, we need to avoid uh, division by 0. So when x is 5, our first derivative is undefined. And that's a little too wonky. There we go. So our first derivative is undefined. So right now that means we could have a vertical tangent happening at x equals 5. We might have a sharp point happening at x equals 5. I mean, I guess it's possible it could be a domain restriction there at x equals 5 in our original function. Maybe it's some vertical asymptote. But if we go look at it, we realize, oh yeah, it's a cube root of a quadratic. Uh, we don't have to worry about negatives. There's no division by zero. So that means as of right now, I guess I better look at our derivative here again. First derivative. Um, right now I can just uh, rule out the fact that that's uh, definitely not a discontinuity for our original function, but it's either a sharp point or a vertical tangent. And it's too early to tell which it is. So we move on now to our sine diagram for our first derivative. Of course, we'll label those two critical values. And time will tell what's going on with that x equals 5. And I guess the x equals 3 critical value as well. So I don't put a whole lot of thought into where I put those, as long as they're, of course, in the correct order on the number line. That's the important thing, because now we're going to test our first derivative uh, to the left of 3. And I'll plop in x equals 0, and we'll get minus 15 don't really care about the 15, quite honestly. I care about the fact that I have a negative on the top of that fraction. And then remember, I'm putting in 0, so I'll have 3 times the cube root of a negative. So whatever those numbers happen to be, it's negative 15 on the top and on the bottom. Don't really care. I know I have a negative divided by a negative, so my first derivative is positive up until from negative infinity to positive 3. And then we move on to the middle interval there in our sine diagram. So when x is 4, right smack in the middle, we'll have 20 minus 15 on the top of our first derivative. I'm way up here, obviously. And then on the bottom, I'll still have 3 times the cube root of a negative. So I have a positive divided by a negative. And whatever those specific numbers happen to be, don't care. Um, because it's just the fact that I want to recognize that I have negative tangent slopes uh, in this function between 3 and 5. And the last one, something to the right of 5, how about 6? We'll have 30 minus 15, which is positive, positive 15. But again, I only care that it's positive. And on the bottom, for the first time, we have 3 times uh, the multiple, uh, 3 multiplied by the cube root of a positive number. So we finally get a positive on the bottom. So we have finally, I guess, 
Uh, finally, once again, positive tangent slopes. So now we can figure out what our function's doing. Uh, we have an increasing function here. I'll just abbreviate it because we have positive tangent slopes function going up. Uh, we have a decreasing function here. Negative tangent slopes function going down. And yes, back to an increasing function. So our function zigzagging up and down, which means both of these things are turning points. So now I know that x equals 5. There can't be a vertical tangent there. So that undefined first derivative, there's got to be some kind of a sharp point happening at x equals 5. Uh, regardless, we can uh, now uh, classify our turning points, and that's essentially all we need to do in this question because uh, we're not quite ready to sketch something like this until we get, uh, I guess, a little more armed and dangerous with our second derivative as well. Um, so let's just remind, I guess I will remind you how we can determine whether those uh, turning points are local maxes or local mins. Uh, if I can move that down a little bit, just put in some hypothetical tangents. And keep in mind at x equals 3, our first derivative was 0. So I could say tangent slopes are positive, tangent slopes flat line at 0 at x equals 3, and then tangent slopes are negative. And that's definitely tracing out the contour of a local maximum value. And then over here, tangent slopes are negative. I'm tempted to say horizontal, but it was like, hey, wait, that critical value was when our first derivative was undefined. So can't say there's a horizontal tangent there because that's not true so but we can go back to positive tangents so probably makes sense that that's a local uh, minimum value and guess what the reason this derivative is undefined at five is some kind of a sharp point because we ruled out the other possibilities so we got a local max sorry local minimum there because our function's going uh, down and then up as opposed to up and then down for our first uh, turning point. So let's summarize. Uh, the last thing that we got to do is figure out our ordered pairs, which is a little annoying, but we'll at least write down that we have a couple of turning points. f of x has, and I'm not going to call them turning points anymore because we're past that. We can now refer to them as local max and min. So f of x has a local there as a local max. And unfortunately, you need to figure out the coordinates. So at x equals 3 and something else. We'll figure that out in a few minutes, the y coordinate. And a local minimum. At x equals, well, not x equals 5, at the order pair 5. And again, something else. So we'll leave some space there and we'll have to go hunt up our original function. I think I'll just rewrite it right here. I think I remember it. It was x multiplied by the cube root, but remember we actually simplified that. Or I guess factor to that quadratic. So remember we could call that x minus 5 squared. Or you could call it x squared minus 10x plus 25. Same thing, but I think this will be easier to evaluate especially at the five, we can see when we put five into this uh, cube root, we get the cube root of zero. So it's gonna be five times zero. So we know our, our ordered pair, our local minimum is gonna happen at five and zero. So that's an X intercept. We have that local minimum happening of that sharp point for this function. And then the other one, which is a little annoying as well, is we have to evaluate this function at positive three for our local maximum. And that's gonna be three multiplied by the cube root of 3 minus 5, which of course is negative 2 squared. So maybe need a little more space here. we got to fit in that abstract value, y value. Uh, it's just a cube root. There's too many 3s here. So it's going to be 3 multiplied by the cube root of negative 2 squared, which of course is 4. Okay, so we got our exact coordinates of our turning points that we've also classified. The first one at x equals 3, that's a local maximum. And the second one, which was the weird one, that was our local minimum that uh, came uh, from having a critical value that uh, caused uh, division by 0 or caused our first derivative to be undefined. So that's not the most characteristic situation in the world, but it's definitely uh, something you need to be aware of.
Uh, I think most of the time you're probably going to encounter critical values that make your first derivative equal to zero, but please don't uh, dismiss uh, critical values that make your first derivative undefined because as we uh, see in this example, it can be a legit turning point and it's an important structural piece uh, of this function. Okay, and as we wrap up here, let's have a look at uh, this function in Desmos here and we were definitely correct. Our suspicions were correct about a sharp point at x equals 5. Our x-intercept there, 5 and 0, is definitely a sharp point and we can see our other uh, local maximum uh, ordered pair listed there as well x equals three and over here you can see that yeah that is three comma three cube root four which is approximately 4.762 so let's put on a point of tangency here somewhere bounce it back to maybe roughly the origin and we'll put on our tangent line and we'll just go through and make sure we understand our previous findings. So we have a positive tangent slopes, which means our function's going up, which of course it is. And then our function uh, peters out here at a, at a uh, local maximum value because that tangent slope is zero. So it's right now, I know it's a stationary point, uh, but once I keep moving, our function starts to come down and we start to see negative tangent slopes so our functions decreasing so that's our function completely turns around at that stationary point which is why we went one uh, more and called it a turning point and keep in mind we're calling it a local maximum it's not the biggest uh, y value our function can have um, over here obviously where we've our function has surpassed 4.762 and it's definitely going off our graph paper, but just in the vicinity of that ordered pair, that's what we mean by a local maximum value. So function then decreases, and then things get kind of strange around here at that sharp point, uh, but if I, and I succeeded in getting that tangent, uh, point of tangency to stick right on that x-intercept, and you can see our tangent line disappeared. It doesn't want anything to do with the sharp point. And that's essentially because uh, from either side, um, as our tangent line is getting closer to 5, I guess our point of tangency getting closer to 5 from the left and the right, both of those uh, lines, uh, tangent lines, are getting ridiculously steep and they are approaching vertical tangents. But more importantly, from the right, we see really, really steep positive tangents and from the left, really, really steep negative tangents. So the behavior there is kind of chaotic, which is typical of sharp points. Uh, and and uh, with functions, which is why our first derivative was undefined there. Um, but it's still a legit uh, local minimum value. And then we, uh, after we get past x equals 5, we encounter positive tangent slopes again, and our function takes off the graph paper. And keep in mind, in the vicinity of x equals 5, that is the smallest y value that we can have, a y value of 0. So that is a legit local minimum value because, uh, remember, by definition, it's a turning point, which can be classified as a local min in this case because our function changes direction at that ordered pair. It comes down and decreases, and then it increases. And we're calling it local again because over here there's lots of y values that can uh, go a lot lower than the y value of 0. So there it is, uh, all of our first derivative work paid off and we were able to uh, predict uh, the most important structural, I guess, characteristics of this function. And in the next video we'll start to look at uh, how the second derivative can also add some information to a function such as this. And then with that new information in the next video we can probably sketch a function like this by hand without the 